again. <laughs> so I, uh, I think I need my own sermon. Because Brian began to pray for Pastor Dennis, and I was like, what? What about me? <laughs> but he was saving the best for last. No, that's not true. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So now you guys may have heard of the classic novel by Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. Remember that? That's the, our favorite version, my favorite version. Amanda and I, we own it like in the big box set is the A&E version starring Colin Firth and Jennifer L. Fantastic. Some of you are nodding. I see that. Thank you. Um, so it's the, for those of you who don't know, it's the respectable love story of uh, between a prideful, middle-class uh, young woman named Elizabeth Bennett, who is coming close to age, meaning she's kind of getting to be the category of an old maid. And so she's forced to have to find a husband and marry for money due to some circumstances. And a very arrogant and prejudiced, rich, upper-crust young man named uh, Mr. Fitzwilliam Darcy. Now. The story makes for a very amusing tale. And aside from the title, uh, the tale shares a very common theme found in the book of Luke, and that is the humiliation of those who are prideful. The humiliation of those who are prideful, and especially the Pharisees and the religious rulers of Jesus' day. So what I want you to do is turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, verses 7 through 14, as we learn about Pride and prejudice. Pride and prejudice. Luke 14, chapter 7. Uh, Luke chapter 7, verse... Chapter 14, verse 7. There you go. So, last Sunday, Pastor Dennis began a uh, new section of Luke. And not surprisingly, it's another section involving the Pharisees uh, and the way Jesus interacted with them. So this time, though, Jesus has been invited to one of the leading Pharisees' house for a special Sabbath meal. Now, all the heavy hitters are there, okay? So, and, and these guys are inviting Jesus because, if you remember, they want to see if they can trip him up. Back in chapter 11, we learned that the Pharisees had set out to find ways to trap Jesus in false teachings and blasphemies, right? But Jesus is no fool. He knows that's what's going on, right? I mean, he walks in and there's a man with dropsy, right? And he sees it. He knows what's going on. Okay, so we're going to see this week that, well, you saw last week that as they set out to trip him up, but it's Jesus who actually trips them up, right? So there are two common themes found in the book of Luke that are both present here in this story. And the first, as Pastor Dennis covered really well last week, was that the Pharisees were very frustrated with Jesus healing on the Sabbath. But we learned that the Sabbath was made for man to celebrate, not man for the Sabbath. Right? And we learned that sometimes it's kind of necessary to have to do things on the Sabbath, like rescue your ox or even your child that falls in a well. You're not going to leave it there until it's dark, right? Oh, I'm so sorry, Samantha. I, I can't help you until, you know, 6 o'clock, right? We're not going to do that. So Jesus, though, decides that what a more befitting opportunity than on the day of rest to give a man rest from all his infirmities. I mean, that's what the day was created for. So what a befitting celebration. And finally, Pastor Dennis taught us that the proof that we love God is how well we love other people. The proof that we love God is how well we love other people. And today and next week, we'll continue on in this uh, Sabbath encounter setup, as I like to call it. So today we're going to look at that second theme, um, probably the most prominent indictment that Jesus had against the Pharisees, and that is the issue of pride. Next week, we'll continue on and the excuses that come from pride. But before we begin, let us pray. Father, we do thank you uh, for this opportunity to be here and share in your word. Um, thank you so much um, that we have these stories to strengthen us and guide us. And Lord, I thank you most of all that we don't ever change as people. We're still the same. And that these stories that are 2,000 years old are just as important then as they are now. Father, we pray that you would give us ears to hear, a heart to receive it, and a will to follow after you. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. So in verse 7, right, um, we begin. And he begins speaking a parable to the invited guests. And when he noticed they had been picking out places of honor at the table, 
Did you see that? He noticed that these people were pulling out places of honor. See, Jesus is always watching people. Do you remember in the temple when the widow, she put her two little copper coins in? What was he doing? He was standing there watching people. And see, I've learned from that. And I've learned that if I sit back and watch people long enough, they give themselves away without even saying anything. See, God is always, always watching. And he sees you when no one else sees you. When you think no one is watching, who you are when no one is around is who you really are. As a matter of fact, Jeremiah, the Lord says this, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. That means he knows your motives. And he certainly knows the Pharisees' motives. And so he's going to dish out what they deserve, right? So here's Jesus, right? He comes to this thing. He sees the man with dropsy. He knows what's going on. And Jesus is just kind of hanging out, watching. And, you know, maybe some of these guys are, oh, how are you, Amos? And they bow, big band vest gestures. And, you know, getting close to that seat of honor where he's going to sit so that when it's time to eat, they could just plop down like, you know, musical chairs. The music went out. Now I'm going to sit. Or maybe they say, oh, how are you? Maybe he says, excuse me, may I sit there, please? You know, these people are vying for this place of attention. And so Jesus comes along after he heals this man and he says, now imagine this, in the middle of this, after this healing, he calls them on their sin. And he says this, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, why a wedding feast? Because a wedding feast is a very prominent, prominent celebration. As a matter of fact, it is the first celebration that God ever created. And that was the marriage ceremony. Now, wedding feasts had lots of people. These celebrations lasted sometimes seven days. So there, all the town officials would be there. Your neighbors, your relatives, your friends. There's going to be a lot of people here, and it's a very public place where there's going to be a lot of honor to be had, okay? So that's why he picks the wedding feast. And he continues in verse 8. He said, look, when you go and are invited to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this man. And then, in disgrace, you proceed to occupy the last place. But when you are invited, go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Let's stop there. You see, honor is given, not taken. Honor is given, not taken. Now, we've all seen the movie. We know the movie. We can pick a thousand movies. They're out there where they're at some kind of award banquet or something. And there's that prideful, arrogant, self-absorbed, self-important guy with all those little cronies around them. And they're getting ready to announce the winner. And he stands up, right? And he buttons his jacket. And he's getting ready to speak. And they announce the underdog. And this guy's like, oh, his face is on the floor. He has to eat crow and sit. Maybe he's even got to sit and shake hands with this guy. And meanwhile, the underdog is like, me? Oh, I didn't think he was even going to be me, right? That's what Jesus is talking about. That's what's going on here. See, the self-important person is filled with pride. And as a matter of fact, pride is nothing more than self-importance. Pride is self-importance. And many of the Pharisees and many of the religious leaders were self-important. And sadly, there are many leaders today who are self-important. In fact, I believe that Jesus taught more boldly on any other topic about this. And he taught more boldly in front of the masses about being like the Pharisees. It was part of his regular teaching. Part of his regular teaching. So what do self-important people look like? Well, if we turn to, you don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll turn there for you. If you go to Matthew chapter 6, which is the Sermon on the Mount, the verses would be we're going to look at so you can write them down for labor. Later, our Matthew 6 verses 1 through 6, right? We're going to get a picture of what self-important people look like. So Jesus stands up amongst the crowd and he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So when you give to the poor... 
Do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward in full. Now, you know how the Pharisees would give? They walk, right? And just picture this. You know, these guys who were well fed, right? Their big long robes, their big phylacteries and frontals on their head and they're walking and they say, oh, look at what the Lord is giving to you. Let me pray for you, my brother. They would walk down these narrow streets in Jerusalem and they would stop and bend down so that their big behinds would block all the traffic and they would do the same thing so everybody would see. Look at how generous I am. Bless you, bless you. Right? That's what they would do. But what does Jesus say? He says, no. He says, when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right is doing. Why? So that your giving will be in secret and your father who sees in secret, he will reward you. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they may be seen by men. But truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. They wanted to be noticed by everyone. He says, but when you pray, go into your inner room. Close the door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. Self-important people love to talk about themselves. They love to make a show of things. They love to tell others about all the great things they've done. They tell people about how much they've donated to the church. They tell people, oh, I get so frustrated by these other people. Nobody does what I do at this church and can do it like I do. They don't trust other people because nobody will do it the best way. Nobody will do it like me. They'll just mess it up. Self-important people say, I, I, I. Self-important people, self-importance is telling others how good you think you are. Telling others how good you think you are. Right, but what did Jesus say? How did he start out his Sermon on the Mount? With the Beatitudes. The attitudes that you should be like. Be like this. And then the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is what not to be like, the Pharisees. And here's what he says. The first beatitude is this. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That word is the word humble. For they will inherit the kingdom of God. God will give them something for their humility. And interestingly enough, as I was driving back from Safeway this morning, there was actually a sermon on, and a guy was preaching this about blessed are the poor in spirit. And he said a really great analogy, and I, and I tried to remember it. But he said something of the idea is that, that people who are, are poor in spirit, the opposite is being full of yourself. You're rich in yourself. And I thought it was really, really a great illustration, so I, so I had to say it, right? So this, um, God is, is, is not a respecter of persons. There is no room for self-importance in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is for those people who are humble in nature. That means that your greatness means nothing to him. He's the Lord of the universe. Like he made everything that's in it. Who's greater than he? In fact, scripture teaches this in Proverbs uh, 16, uh, 18 through 19. It says, pride goes before destruction. And a haughty or a high spirit before stumbling. It is better to be humble in spirit with the lowly than, despite, than to divide the spoils with the proud. Why? Because James, the brother of Jesus, says this, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, to those who are poor in spirit. Submit, therefore, to God. See, God hates pride. He hates it. I think of all the different pride movements that are out there on the internet. And when I Googled looking for pictures of pride things and ways that I was going to do this, there was so much pride. There was like Aussie pride for the Australians and German pride and gay pride and, you know, and all kinds of different prides out there. And all it was were just pictures of people flaunting who they were and saying, look at how great we are. Look at how great we are. 
And I'll be honest with you, the pictures that I seen were not of great things. They were things that God said, this is not permissible. Pride flies in the face of God. And let me tell you, I tell you from experience, my friends, it is easy to fall prey to self-importance. Do you remember the 70 disciples that Jesus sent out in chapter 10? There were 70. He didn't just send the disciples out, the 12. He sent lots of people out. So in chapter 10, we, there's a story of Jesus. He sends out 70 people and he gives them authority over all the powers of the enemy. And he gives them the ability to tread scorpions and, and all these horrible things and to heal people and do everything that he can do. And when they returned, they were rejoicing and they were saying, Lord, even the demons bow down to us. They're subject in your name. Yeah. And Jesus said, hey, I was watching Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Do not rejoice that your spirits are subject to you, but that your names are recorded in the book of heaven. Satan fell like greased lightning because of his pride. He wanted to put himself above God. He became so self-important because of all the gifts that God had given him, all the while forgetting it was God who gave it to him. And so instead, right, he, what does he do? God says, no, not in my kingdom. Not in my kingdom. There is no room for self-important greatness in my kingdom. And how fast does lightning travel? That fast. That's how fast God opposes the proud. And in the scheme of eternity, that's pretty quick. It's the reason we all suffer from this disease of sin. You see, self-importance doesn't rejoice in the goodness of others. Instead, it seeks to destroy it. Satan came to Adam and Eve and convinced them that they were good enough on their own and that they didn't need God. And man bought it hook, line, and sinker. And man fell like lightning. So what does humility look like? If you said Jesus, you'd be right, right? Isn't that the church answer, Jesus, right? But it's true. But let me tell you about what a, 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 an ancient, by our standards, theologian and pastor, Matthew Henry, um, said he was a nonconformist theologian, uh, meaning he was a Puritan, and a pastor who lived and wrote in the late 1800s and the early 1700s, born in Wales, moved to England. And he said this, Instead of being proud that so many give place to us, it should be humbling to us that there are so many that we give place to. It should be humbling to us that there are so many that we must give place to. See, humility celebrates others. It steps out of the way to make room for others at the table. It appreciates the God in others. It recognizes that without God, a person is only wretched, Pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Revelation 3.17. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a tax collector and one a Pharisee. And the Pharisee stood up and he prayed and he said, Oh Lord, I thank you that I am not like others. Adulterers filled with all types of injustices and swindlers and even like that tat gatherer over there. Lord, I fast twice a week and, and I, I pay tithes and all that I get. But the tax collector standing just some distance away was even unwilling to lift his eyes to heaven and he beat his breast saying, God... Have mercy on me, for I am a sinner. And I tell you the truth, it was this man who went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled like lightning, and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord who sees everything. Take a sober look at who you really are. And when you do, he himself will lift you up. So let's get back to the story. Our Sabbath meal here. And um, Jesus didn't stop with the guests. No, no, no. Um, he's, he's, there's more than status seekers there. He turns his attention to the prejudiced host, right? Jesus doesn't leave anybody out. 
So in verse 12, we see this. Well, I can find verse 12. He says in verse 12, um, And he went on to say to the one who invited him, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors. Otherwise, they may also invite you in return. And, well, that will be your repayment. But when you give a reception, invite the poor, crippled, lame, blind, and you will be blessed since they do not have the means to repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. Now, Jesus is not talking about having your friends over or your family or your relatives, okay? He, he's not saying, you know, I love to get together with Pastor Dennis and Jennifer. We love to get together and, you know, and listen to Journey. And we love to, you know, get together with Matt and Courtney and others of you in the church we have Valerie over. And we just hang out and have a good time. He's not talking about that, okay? There, there's nothing wrong. Far from it. As a matter of fact, Scripture says we should be doing that. That's fellowship, okay? That's important. But what is Jesus talking about? Jesus is talking about doing things for others so that they will do things for you. It's doing things with ulterior motives. Why don't I invite certain people over to my house or throw banquets for them? Simple. Because they can do nothing for me in return. How will they ever betray me? And this, my friends, is prejudice. Prejudice is really pride. And I have about 10 or 12 pages of notes, which I have spared you. Trust me. I could write a whole sermon on this and demonstrate to you how even the, the worst kind of prejudice is really just pride. Prejudice is pride that asks the question, what have you to offer me? And of course, they answer their own rhetorical question with nothing. Prejudice believes you have nothing to offer me. It is really just self-exaltation at someone else's expense. Prejudice is looking down on those you deem less honorable than you. It's just another form of self-importance. I mean, why should I give to people who can't possibly give me anything in return? The crippled, the poor, the blind, the lame, they don't even work. I'm not giving them a handout. Why do people give? A lot of people give because they want something in return. And people ask the question all the time, well, what do you give me if I give you this or that thing? Yeah, it's too, what's in it for me, right? Listen, listen, stand back like Jesus and watch. You'll hear it. You see, a Pharisee, gives in front of people because he wants something in return. And it's not a reward from God. He believes he's already got that reward. There's nothing else he needs to do. See, they want praises from men. They want to show people just how generous and kind they are. Remember the Pharisees? How they would give in the narrow streets? They give then because they get their reward immediately. Everyone's seeing how important they are. And that is just a curse, especially of this generation now. We are really close. We want everything immediate. Immediate gratification, immediate results, immediate answers. I want immediate pictures on the internet so that I can get my sermon together. But my internet wasn't working, so we have this. So, <laughs> it's true. But when Jesus said, when you give to the poor... Do not let your hand know what your right, left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret. And your father who sees in secret, well, he will reward you. The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none. And he who has food is to do likewise. I want to read another passage for you. Matthew 6. Uh, 31 through 34. Or, I'm sorry, Luke, I think it should be. 631 through 34 in Luke. He says, treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even the sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even the sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive? What 
credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, now catch this, expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. There's your answer. Why do we give to those who can't possibly repay us? Because when you give to people who can't repay you, you are acting like a child of God. You are imitating your heavenly Father. You are, ex you are, 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 are expressing God to those people. Paul, in his second letter to the Corinthians, when he was explaining why the Corinthians should give to those in need in Jerusalem, uses this very same reason. And he cites Psalm 112, and he says this, He has freely, meaning the Lord, given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn will be exalted in honor. The wicked will see it and be vexed. They will be angry. And he will gnash his teeth. And melt away. The desire of the wicked will perish. My friends, the prideful and the prejudiced get angry at your good deeds and they shake their fist at it and it makes them angry. God exalts the humble, but he opposes the proud. The proud will be thrown down. Prejudice says, I have so much to offer, I'm not wasting it on you. But God told the Israelites, the people of God of the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 15, chapter, verses 7 through 11, he says, look, they're going to be poor and needy always. These people are your brothers, your sisters. And to harden your heart and not give to them is sin. These people around you here today, these are your brothers and sisters. And my friends, there are people among us, brothers and sisters, who have needs. And for you not to give to them is sin. But on the reverse, you need to make your needs known. Fair? Okay. And then if we don't do something, then you have a right to complain. He said, give generously to them. And don't be grieved when you do it. Oh, i got to give here. Because God's going to reward you. That's what he says. He will bless you in return. He will bless all that you do, he says. And I tell you that he can repay you more than you ever could repay. Those people could ever repay you. And because they cannot repay you, God will repay you for all you do. And Jesus said in Matthew 25, when he separated the sheets from the goat, he said, whatsoever you do to the least of these, you've done it unto me. God has given you and me so much. All that we have, every bit of it comes from him. In fact, what can you give to God that he has not already given to you or does not already have or does not even own? Nothing. We would do well to remember that without Christ, we are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Just like those people who can't repay you. Can you really repay God for what he's done for you? You are powerless in your sin to do anything good. And God gave us his very own son for you and for me and for all those people out there who do not know Jesus Christ. So that all who would believe that Jesus Christ is who he is, as we sang in the creed, all those things, every bit of it. God clothed you and me in garments of white. He covered us with the righteousness of Christ. He shed his blood so that you and I would never have to taste hell and death. And for those who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their life, they will, we will be exalted in the resurrection of the righteous. God himself will reward you for all that you've given to those who could not possibly repay you. 
See, when you're giving for eternal rewards, right? It's kind of like redeemable points and airline miles on your credit card. The more you do it, the more responsible you are with it, the greater the payback to you. I flew first class. I was very excited about that too. <laughs> first class, right? That's what's awaiting us. And these points, these rewards, they are redeemable at the resurrection of the righteous. So who are the righteous? Well, the righteous are those who have been given the right to be called children of God. The righteous are those who are truly disciples of Jesus Christ. The righteous are those who do right by God. Those in line with His high moral integrity, who are upright, just, and fair. Those who accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and proved to be so by living a life as He modeled it for us. Those who live by faith. Those who love one another as he has loved you. So what is the cure? What is the antidote for pride and prejudice? How do you rid yourself of the sin of self-importance? Well, the antidote is to learn from Jesus. Right? Jesus said that we should uh, take our, my yoke upon you and learn from me. Because I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke is a thing that oxen wear and beasts of burden that they pull the plow and things. And metaphorically means the things that we must carry along to serve Jesus. It's easy compared to the Pharisees. It's light. And as a matter of fact, this very scripture that we often use that say, come find rest for your souls, which is true, is, is directly in contrast to the Pharisees whose burden was heavy, that they themselves would not lift one finger to help somebody. Learn from me, he said. I will show you the way. I will show you how. And isn't that is exactly what he told Philip at the Last Supper? He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you have seen me, Philip, you have seen what God is like. Be like me. And you will make it to where I am. Now I have to tell you. There really is no quick fix for pride. I, I really am sorry to say that. I, I wish there was something you could do and be done. Pride is a spiritual cancer. And it takes time to root it out. I know. I was a very prideful person when I first came to faith. And I was prevented from doing a lot in the church because of my pride. It took a long time. And then finally one day, my pastor said to me, Hey, you want to do this? One little thing. And I said, Really? And he said, Yeah, you've changed. Thanks, Rick. How long it takes really depends on you. It really does. How hard are you willing to study and learn and follow Jesus? But the good news is, right, is that he said that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That means he's going to give you straightforward stuff. You don't have to try to figure it out and rack your brains. It's doable. And with whatever the Holy Spirit's going to fill in, it's completely attainable. That's the second bit of good news, that you get the Holy Spirit. God's own Holy Spirit comes and lives inside you when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, right? And He, he gives you understanding. He illumines, is what we say in, in seminary. He illuminates. He makes the things of God, your eyes open to them so you can understand them. You have super pow supernatural power flowing through you to help move you along. Holy Spirit, He fills in what you're lacking, but you still have to do your part. Right? When you're weak and you can't, you struggle, he'll fill in, he'll be strong for you. Right? But he's not going to do what you won't allow him to do. It's you and he working together. And finally, and then we're done. So how do you begin learning from Jesus? 
How do you begin learning from Jesus? By reading your Bibles on a regular basis. You see, you have to spend time around him to learn about him and to learn from him. You've got to put in a little bit of study time too. Not hours. I mean, that would be good, but not hours. Some. Something more than you're doing now. And you need to talk to him on a regular basis. And you need to sit and listen on a regular basis. <coughs> Set some time aside a day. 15 minutes in the morning. Get up 15 minutes earlier. Time on your lunch break. I know your lunch break is not long. But it has to be more than, bless us, O oh Lord, for these are gifts. Thank you for making me fall. Right? Your meal is not the time to catch up. Right? If you can't do because you get up so early, find three days a week. Take some time on your day off. Just do something more than you're doing now. And don't tell me, Pastor Tim, I don't have the time. You don't know my schedule. You don't understand what it's like. Bullpucky, I've been there. I've been there. I worked for teleperformance. I worked all crazy hours, 15-hour shifts, whatever, and I still made an effort at least several times a week to put that time in. And you think, well, oh, you're a pastor. You sit around all day long and read this. I could tell you that's far from the truth. That is far from the truth. And this is not a boast. This is Paul talking about his pedigree. If you really knew what our days consisted of, those of us who serve, there are days where I, I look at Dennis and, and Dennis looks at me and we just shut the door and we just pray together because we're just so busy serving other people. And Dennis is like, I've got to write my sermon. You don't understand, it's Thursday. I haven't started yet. You know, that's what it's like. Phone calls all hours of the night and the morning. And we are happy to take them. That's what we love to do. That's why we do it. God wired us that way. So we're great. But we make the time. You can too. 15 minutes. 10 minutes. Get an app on your phone, a little Bible app. Amanda, in the morning, listens to Alistair Begg on her phone while she's putting on her makeup. She listens to him, and I just go my own separate way because I'm busy getting ready, my daughter ready. She's in work by six. She gets the time in. You can do it too. All right? Another way that you can begin learning, you know, to be honest with you, really what it boils down to is it's an issue of time management. People say all the time, oh, and, I, and I show them their schedule, show me what you did. So you got time right here. Oh, well, then they have an excuse. What about here? Oh, I have an excuse. Well, we'll talk about excuses next week. It's really time management. And it's really what are you willing to give up in your life to sacrifice to spend a little time with Jesus? You'll spend time for your girlfriend. You'll spend time for your kids. You'll spend time for your wife. But the creator of the universe, we don't have time for. That, I get it. Believe me, I'm there. I have days. Okay, I do. I do. But I remind myself of that. And you can too. Another way to begin learning about Jesus is you can take our Discovering Maturity class. Now, this class really is a great way about all to wait to learn about all the different ways there are that you can learn about Jesus. Our job as leaders is to equip you, to get you ready. We're going to give you lots of different tools for your toolbox. And then you can pick and choose which ones work for you. You can modify them. You can do whatever. But you don't know what's available out there unless you do it. We're not going to try to make you all super spiritual Christians that when you walk in, the light shines and all. Like, th those, that's unrealistic. Nobody's like that. Just Jesus. Right? Just pick the ones that work. And finally, let me leave you with some practical thinking given to us by the Apostle Paul, right? Something you could begin doing right now, okay? And it's changing your mindset. And Brian read it for us earlier. Philippians 2, verse 3, he says, Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with all humility of mind, of mind, regard others, one another, as more important than yourselves. Do not look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ. And here's the attitude. Although he existed in the form of God, he was God, right? He did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. If anybody was, could have been self-important, it's Jesus, right? He said, no, not me. And he emptied himself 
taking the form of a bond servant, an indentured servant, a slave that received nothing back from his wages, for his work, no wages from his work. And being made in the appearance of men, he humbled himself. He humbled himself by being obedient to the commands of God to the point of death, even death on a cross. He went the whole full Monty. For this reason also, here it is, God highly exalted him. God exalted him. Jesus didn't exalt himself. God the Father exalted the Son and bestowed on him the name which is above every other, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord through the glory of God the Father. Jesus humbled himself, and God the Father lifted him up. Jesus is proof that God exalts the humble. If it were not so, I would not have told you so. And Satan is the proof that God opposes to the proud. Now in the novel, Pride and Prejudice, both, both Miss Bennett and Mr. Darcy were able to overcome their self-importance, right? And they did wind up having that respectable love relationship that they desired. But they had a lot of people working against them. Those who were so self-important, they didn't want to see them find the happiness because they themselves were miserable. Misery loves company. But they resisted. They resisted. And eventually, they went out and got married. They were able to overcome their pride and their prejudice. And just like Miss Bennett and Mr. Darcy, there are people in your life who are going to try to keep you from overcoming because of their own pride and prejudice. They're not going to want to see you happy. Don't give in. And remember, Satan... He wants nothing more than to see you have, to keep you from that love relationship with God, with Christ. And so I close with James. He says this, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, our gracious God and King, oh Lord, heaven seems so far away at times. It seems so far away. Like when, when is our exaltation going to come? I, I need to do it now. I need a taste of that now. Father, I pray that you would give us a taste of that now. Give us all in our mind's eye as we sit here with our eyes closed. A taste in our heart of the exaltation that we will receive because we've humbled ourselves. But Lord, in the scheme of eternity, this is just a drop in the bucket, Lord. This is nothing. This is a flash, a light bulb burning out. And we will spend a whole eternity with you, spending our rewards on what I don't know. But you have a lot of reward for us. And I don't think it's wrong, Lord, to do things for those reasons. We want your rewards. We want your rewards. Because you offer them. That, of course that's motivation. Why, why would you keep that a secret from us? But the one thing that we do know, Lord. <laughs> oh, Lord, we know that even those who are stuck in our pride and our prejudice right now, we know that you love us and that you're sharing these things with us because you want to see us move forward. You want to see us be exalted in that day. Even though, Lord, it's like lightning, there's still a lot of time for you in that snap. And there's a lot of time for us. But don't let us wait too long. Let us not tarry. Lord, your love is amazing. It's higher than any mountain, greater than any sea, deeper than any chasm, wider wider than we could ever throw our arms as far as the east is from the west Lord that is how much you love us that you've proven that by giving us your son Jesus your love remains Lord in the end that's what we'll have the proof of your love 
I think, Lord, of that old song that I know where it says, when the heavens pass away, your scars will still remain and forever they will say just how much you love me. Be with us, Lord, we pray. In your great name, Jesus.